Good morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day, the fifth Sunday of Lent. Somebody wanted to push me to Palm Sunday last week, and I said, I need another week. So uh, it is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and we are glad that you are here. Several announcements and uh, sharing of prayer concerns as we begin our worship this day. Uh, First, uh, Jane sends her regards and best wishes. I had a wonderful visit for a couple hours with her last Sunday, and we've talked and texted on the phone several times since. She is going to be uh, in the, there for a couple of more weeks, maybe two weeks. We're thinking I'm hearing after I said one week earlier, somebody has informed me, probably two more weeks or as long as the insurance pays and they don't kick her out uh, to get her full strength back. She's ready to come home, but they're going to make sure she is really ready to come home. Uh, she says Shelton and um, Phil are batching it up and they're doing well. And thanks be for the technology of FaceTime. They still get times to visit each day, and that is a wonderful, wonderful gift to have. Um, I heard from Susan that her brother is doing well, or as well as can be expected. He's having to come off of some medicine to go on some new medicine, and that always leads to some side effects uh, that go along with that. Um, But prayers that he'll get a good scan this coming week. I think it's on Friday, if I recall, so prayers for that. Um, Also, prayers of remembrance for our van. It died, uh, so we have a new vehicle out there. So a couple of you was worried the preacher wasn't here this morning. I knew. I saw you come in thinking it's going to be a short service. It's not. Um, So uh, we are uh, indeed glad that you are here. Also, uh, Thanksgiving for David, who is filling in for Melanie, who was filling in for Jane while she recovers. Uh, David had the piano going when I got here this morning. Had there been a a bowl up on the piano, I might have put a tip in. And so uh, he's very impressive and a jack of all trades and and a blessing to this church. So we appreciate him filling in. Finally, uh, we are excited to welcome Restore uh, 634, and they're going to be sharing with us uh, several things in just a minute uh, as one of the things that this church has helped support now for for several years um, in in its giving. Uh, But first, would want to know of other prayer concerns among God's people this day. Prayers for her. Yeah. No. No. Prayers, prayers for her and for patience and, and all of these things. Uh, we want to get better so quickly, and it often takes a lot longer than that. And will tell you, she has learned patience and nothing else over the last few years. Other prayer concerns this day. Then I am going to thank Sydney, who's helping with technology. Uh, and we have some video that we're going to show and some slideshows. I think uh, we're going to hit the lights back there. But I'm going to let you come and introduce yourself and what all you do for Restore 634 and then share your story, which we're excited to hear. If you'll stand there, they can hear you on our... Okay, never mind. I know nothing that I am talking about. I'm going to go sit out here and be quiet uh, because I've I've seen the video, but I want to see it again.
Ed Neal will go help. Okay. It's good. about six times. I've been to RSAT twice. I've been to prison um, for 22 months, and I've just been home 10 months, and here I am back again. We see a lot of women get out and come right back in. So as we got to know the ladies and when we would talk to them and ask them about it, oftentimes what we would find is there wasn't a safe place to land when they got out. It's like a magnet when they get out. Those old friends, those old habits tend to want to pull them back into that lifestyle. I want to be able to overcome my addiction, but when you ain't got anywhere to go except back into the same lifestyle, I don't have a whole lot of family, and the family that I do have is in addiction too. When I get out of RSAT, I'll have the best teeth to know, and I have nowhere to go when I get out. I don't know what I'm going to do. Just getting back on your feet is it's hard. Could there be a place in Walker County where these ladies, when they step out of those doors, for us to be able to take them into a home that would be secure, that would be safe, and to give them the support that they needed biblically, we're a discipleship home. And so what we're going to offer is Jesus Christ and his transforming power and the word of God and to be able to stand beside them and it would be something where they could start having success and to, to have what Christ would want for them. Our dream is to be able to house up to 15 of these women plus uh, a house mom. They need discipleship 24-7. roadblock for someone coming out of jail is just going back to the same places and people that they hung around before um, not having transportation to be able to get back and forth to a job and it just leads them going back to using drugs especially if they're on probation and just they end up back in jail over and over and they don't know any different a participant told me after I got here in order to be different you got to do different I was at a place where I had lost everything my house my kids, my car, my marriage. I had no, um, I had nowhere to go. It would definitely be returning to the same place, and uh, it's almost like insanity because you're doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. But I mean, to 
be different, you got to do different, and that would have to be a break in the order of all that chaos. they going back into that and expecting anything to be different. Because it's people out there dysfunction, and it's really hard to get them to do different just because you are. I needed to restore because I knew that God was the only way, that I was going to get sober and stay sober. I felt like I needed to be a part of Restore 634 the minute I heard about it. And I got to Walker County Jail, and um, I had been in a life of crazy chaos, 27 years of addiction, in and out of jail. It was just getting worse and worse and more lengthy. I was telling him, not yet, not yet, not yet. But when I seen the application for Restore and what they did for women here, I knew right then this was the time to make the commitment for God and to God, and this place would help me learn everything I need to learn. It was now, not later. I've come to realize I have to make myself better before I can help anybody else. Mostly, I want to get my kids back in my life and be a positive role model for them. And having God first in my life, I've realized that's, that comes before anything, God and my sobriety. I'm hoping to gain a more personal relationship with Jesus Christ so I can raise my son in a Christian home with Christian beliefs. To learn everything I can about God, to do different, a reset in my life. The most positive things that I'm experiencing here is truths. Um, all the lies that I would tell myself that were defeating and um, was causing me to stand in my own way were all lies. And then I'm replacing them with truths. And that um, I know my worth now and, and uh, how to get my needs met. And that's through Christ. Just the love and the support from all the directors and house moms and volunteers and trainers. It's just amazing. Um, I know when I leave here that I will have friends and a good support system that I can turn to. And also just being with other women that have the same similar situations as I've been through and who wants to uh, turn their life over to the Lord as well. If I could speak to Restore 634's supporters, I would tell them thank you so much for following them. Um, the Lord, and, and being guided by Him to help people like me get my life back on track. I would just say thank you to all of the supporters, because if it weren't for you guys, Restore wouldn't be here. I have truly been restored from one end to the other. It's been a, it's a 180. My health has been restored, my relationships with my family, and it is like replacing with the locusts of Eden. And I mean, there's no words big enough for me to tell you. Thank you. And it means so much knowing that people from my own community just have such a care and compassion for women like me who wants to just lead other people to the Lord.
right now we have a lot of house moms. We have our shifts, but just even having substitute house moms. And uh, prayer and support for those participants that are in the program, please pray for them. Uh, it's hard. Remember, it is hard. Doing uh, things different than you've ever done before is hard, but with Christ, uh, that we're just constantly putting their hand back in the end. Thank you so much for letting me come and tell you about this ministry. We do appreciate our partnership and appreciate you coming in and giving of your, your Sunday morning to be here. I don't know exactly, but you probably can tell us, what is your total budget now to run this program? Wow. So, 15000 a month. I'm supposed to be repeating it so everybody can hear it. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, you're, you're, you're good. Thank you for all you do. I will have Sydney post the link to that video on the church's Facebook site and um, probably on the, the website as well. Uh, they do have a website. I think you saw it there, but we'll maybe put that in the musing this week. And I know that if you're interested in volunteering in any way or finding out more information, uh, that we can be there. But, you know, we're talking about today in church, Lazarus being resurrected. And it seems that we see some resurrection occurring in the lives of a number of ladies as well. So thank you for being here. Let us continue in our worshiping God together. Please join in the bold print of the call to worship. Have you ever felt washed up, brittle, worn down to the bone? Have you ever felt grief lay heavy on your back? Have you ever felt like hope was out of reach? Have you ever wondered, can these bones live? If you have, then you're in the right place, for this is God's house. Hope lives here. So come, cut your bones. <clears throat> Let us worship holy God. If you're able to, please stand and join in hymn number 403, What a Friend. It's hymn number 403.
call to confession. Friends, there is nothing that we have to keep hidden from God, not our anger, our grief, or the ways in which we have fallen short. In confession, we speak honestly and are met with grace. So let us not hold back. Let us bring our full selves to the prayer, knowing that God is already running to meet us. Let us pray. He's joined in the prayer of confession. Jesus of Nazareth, I confess, I forget that you know this feeling. I forget that you too have wept. I forget that you too have lost. I forget that you too have gathered at the tomb, have grieved for a friend, have felt the sting of humanity. Forgive me for all the times I place blame on you. Forgive me for all the times I create distance, imagining that you could never feel what I feel. Forgive me for allowing the valley of dry bones to be a sea of space between us. Pour yourself into the cracks of my heart. Bring these bones back to life. Bring me closer to you. With gratitude, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our assurance of pardon. Friends, you could spend your whole life ignoring God, pushing God away or trying to solve the world's problems all on your own, and God would still love you all the same. Even in our shortcomings, we are God's beloved. So hear and believe this good news. We are saved by grace through faith. We belong to God. We are not alone. Before we read the scripture and hear the word proclaimed, we have a prayer of illumination that the Holy Scripture may illumine our hearts and minds so that we may hear rightly and be prepared to accept God's word for us. Let us pray. Creator God, why is bad news so loud? In the midst of gun violence, hunger, melting ice caps, and anxiety, it often feels like suffering has a microphone. How do we hear you? How do we find you? How do we know that these bones can live? Today, we bring our raw selves into this space, asking that once more, you would rush through this room like a mighty wind. Remind us that these bones can live. Speak to us in your still, small voice and let it be loud enough to speak to the sorrow of the day. We know that good news rests in you, and we know that you are here. So help us listen, not to the bad news of the day alone, but to the hope that you breathe into every word. With open hearts, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture comes from 
Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophecy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act says the Lord. Our second scripture comes from the Gospel of John, verses 11, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellowship, fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, 
your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but he was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man had kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for have, having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so they may believe that you sent me. When he had, had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to, him, to them, Unblind, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Sydney, I did not pick the length of the scripture. You can send that to the lectionary uh, folks, and uh, they will pay no attention to you just like I want. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, in this time and in this space, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, you who art our strength and our redeemer. In Christ, amen. You might remember the movie Shawshank Redemption. In that movie, one of my favorite lines is that we hear hope is a good thing, maybe the best thing. But what exactly is this thing we call hope? Today, that, that, that's what I want us to focus on, that word hope. We, we hear it in the church, but we also hear it in society. Now, anytime I focus on the word or a word, I go and find what's on my desk. I know that can find it on the phone, but it's right behind my desk, actually. It's called a dictionary. And I pull up the dictionary, and I look up the word, and, and old Merriam-Webster will tell you that hope is a verb. And my high school English teacher would have told me it was an action verb. But let's be honest. We don't see a whole lot of hope in action action. It's kind of like thinking. You know, thinking is an action verb, but you don't do much when you're thinking. Except for me, sometimes when I'm sitting and thinking, I move on to napping. But that's a different story. Hope, however, is more a word of of poetry. Ezekiel's words that we have heard only moments ago use that poetic idea of hope to to beautifully describe life 
coming from barrenness. Unfortunately, though, I often think that in that context, hope really does seem to be something that for you and I is, is a thing of inactivity. You know, something that, that lives in fantasy land or in the future or in, in utopia. Something that, that we might experience it. But friends, if that were true, then we as believers would have an empty faith. So I want to take a moment, or as Sidney would say, a lot of moments, to, to talk about what hope means to us as Christians in our daily lives. Because as followers of Jesus, our hope is not in just some far-off paradise after death, but it's a hope that is grounded in the present, a hope that is active, and a hope that requires our participation in the world. Now, as I mentioned, the prophet Ezekiel speaks to us of hope amid despair. The prophet describes being taken into a valley filled with dry bones. The symbolism of this poetry is that the bones represent the Israelites who have lost all hope and are living, but there's no life to them. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, to speak life to them, and Ezekiel does as he's told, and the bones come together, and the breath of God enters them, and they become living beings once again. Friends, that was spoken to Israel, but I think the text continues to speak to us today. That dry bone story reminds us that even in the darkest times, that there is always hope. God can bring new life into what appears to be dead and bring restoration to what seems to be beyond repair. It's a message that speaks to our current situation. Friends, we live in a world plagued by division and injustice and suffering. It can feel like we are in a valley of dry bones. But God is still speaking to us, telling us to prophesy to these bones, to speak life and, and restoration into the world around us. And it's beautiful poetry, and we can have wonderful liturgy about it, but, but I wonder, is it real? Is it real? I mean, we know as Christians we are, we are to believe that we are called to be agents of change in the world, to work towards a more just and equitable society. We believe we're called to be a voice for the voiceless and, and to stand up against oppression and, and systematic injustice. But I'll be honest, that works hard. It's even exhausting. And there are a lot more losses than there are victories. It's easy to lose hope in the face of insurmountable obstacles, some of which seem impossible to overcome. And we decide hope is just poetry. And we hope it'll happen in some far off day. And then along comes this long text from the Gospel of John. The story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. In John, we, receive, we read about Jesus receiving news. His friend Lazarus, the one he loved, is dead. But when he arrives at the tomb, he calls out to Lazarus. And Lazarus emerges from the tomb alive. I'm getting ahead of myself. I do this all the time. Let's go back to the start. Jesus gets a message. He gets a message from Mary and Martha that Lazarus is sick. Now, it's not an instant message. Somebody's had to walk. Maybe they had a donkey, but they had to walk. And in fact, the, the text, you know, it's translated as sick, but if you really look at it, 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 it really means gravely ill. I mean, he's sick, sick. Now, I know 
I know as good Christians and family members as you are, when you and I get a phone call that says someone is gravely ill in our family or our close friends, we would stop what we were doing right then. We, we, we'd leave the dishes in the sink. We, we'd leave the bed unmade. We, we, we would put on whatever we needed. We'd grab our phone charger. Got to grab the phone charger nowadays. And then we would head to the hospital emergency room. Friends, I don't know how many family reunions I have attended in a hospital emergency room waiting for news about an individual who is gravely ill. So Jesus gets the news. His friend is gravely ill. And what does he do? He waits. He waits. It doesn't say why he waited. I really would prefer if it gave him an excuse. You know, maybe it said he was finishing up a contract job and there was a deadline to meet. That'd be okay. Or maybe he didn't have transportation. They only flew out of, uh, of there once or twice a week. He had a plane ticket just as soon as he could get on. It says he chose to wait. Now, his disciples were okay with that. They probably went, oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We're not going back there. You remember last time we were back there, they tried to kill us. We're not going to push it. And then suddenly, suddenly Jesus gets up two days later and says, okay, time to go. The whole story is strange. It seems counterintuitive. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, and it continues not to make a great deal of sense if we're real honest about it. Now, it's obvious. It's obvious that Jesus loves Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It's not the first time we've heard of these folks. Though it really is the first time Lazarus has been sort of the center of the story. It's usually about Mary and and Martha. It's also unusual, at, at least in my way of thinking, that of all of the characters in this story, the only one that doesn't really have anything to say is Lazarus. Lazarus, the one who was raised from the dead, we don't hear a word from. But but, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, Now, as they arrived in town, they would have known someone had died. There would have been that feeling in the air, as well as traditions that went along with mourning. There was always somebody who was waiting on the outskirts of town to be the first one to tell somebody somebody had died. We, we still have that in, the, in these communities. You know, you hear someone has died. You know somebody's going to be the first one to start calling around to let everybody know. So even before Martha greeted them, they knew Lazarus was dead. And they also knew he had been dead for four days. Now, now that scene seemed to be an insignificant detail I mean, once you're dead, you're dead. One day, two days, three days, four days, it really doesn't matter except for the smell. And yet it does. Because in Jewish tradition, in Jewish tradition, it was believed that that after death, that the soul, the soul remained in the body for three days before it departed. So by the fourth day, it was truly an empty carcass. It it was drying bones. Not only was the body dead, but the, the soul had departed as well. And into that, we see Lazarus' sister come running to meet Jesus. It was as one with grief for her brother who was now simply dried bones behind a stone. But she came and met him. 
That's another crucial detail. The custom of the day said that close relatives of the deceased, mothers, fathers, siblings, husbands, wives, they wouldn't have left the house except to go visit the grave until a period of mourning had been completed. You know, somebody had to be there to get all the casseroles. Martha, Martha broke that tradition and the custom of the day. To the community, it would have been unsightly. Even a defiant act to the customs of the Hebrew people. And there too, I think there's an important element. So what do I mean? What do we learn from these seeming unimportant pieces of information, at least to our modern way of thinking? Well, if I understand the text, we can learn that when the world says all hope is lost, when the world says death has gotten the final word and there's no chance of recovery or even repair, God steps in and says, folks, you missed it. You've forgotten what I said. Death, death never gets the final word. Jesus takes the poetry, the poetry we hear in Ezekiel of dry bones being raised up and brought back to life. Jesus takes that poetry which is dismissed as simply beautiful words of allegory and he said, folks, those words are more than that. Those words are made real by my power and my glory. I, the God of Jacob and Abraham, of Isaac and Moses, of Peter and Paul, of saints and martyrs, of you and me and those sitting in prison and those struggling with addiction, they can be overcome even when the world says those folks are, are dead. Physically or emotionally or spiritually. And Jesus wants to show that truth. Jesus waits not because he wants the sisters to suffer, but he waited so that God's glory might be revealed and the words of Ezekiel made true. I also think that there is something else to note in this. When Martha left, when Martha left her home, she went out with an active hope. Not a passive hope. She didn't wait. She went to meet the Lord. It was a hope that had feet attached to it. Friends, our hope needs to have feet attached to it. It was a hope in word and deed. It was even defiant of the rules and the norms of the day. And it was a hope that runs to Jesus. Oh, I hear a lot of people talking about hope. They're hoping for a lot of things. I hope for this. I hope for that. I, I, I hope to become wealthy. I, I, I hope to lose 50 pounds. I, I hope to run a 5K. Most of the time, this is not hoping, it's wishing. They're wishing. And wishing is wonderful from Disney movies, but life. Life isn't like that. You cannot hope without putting your life into action. And Lazarus' sister had hope in Jesus. Now that did not mean her faith was without doubt. In truth, when she arrives, what does she say? She says, our brother would not have died had you been here. I, I had hope in you. I had hope you'd make it on time. And I want you to know I had that hope. That was as much hope as she could muster. Oh, she'd seen Jesus' miracles, but raising dried bones, something you dare not even dream about. So when Jesus says to Martha, don't you believe in the resurrection? Her response is, well, yes, of course I believe. On the last day, all will be raised. And Jesus says, you're missing it. You're still missing the point. He says, I, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. It occurred to me 
it occurred to me when I was preparing this sermon and rereading this text, all 45 verses, several times, Sydney, that in my time here with you, one of the things that I have done that I never expected to do was conduct funeral services. In fact, my Amazon shopping list of books about funerals and funeral service might lead you to think I'm a mortician of some sort. I have conducted more funerals than I even thought I would do in a lifetime. Now, some have been for people that, that I didn't know. They, they had a connection to this church one way or another. Recently, there was one that was for someone I knew a little bit, not near as well as those of you in this room, or at least many of you in, in Harold Wilson. Some, some have been for colleagues, friends of mine from work, who had tragic passings in their families. In each and every one of those cases, I was honored and privileged to be a part of those services. But what I realized from rereading this text is the first line, or almost the first line in every one of those funerals. I got them saved in a folder on my computer. I went back and looked. The first lines in my funeral services begin with this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That I am statement of our Lord is the one that we hold our life on. It is the one upon which our entire faith relies. Jesus in his ministry we know raises some people from the dead. Usually they had only been dead a, a short period of time. Then, then he proves it even further. He raises Lazarus from the dead who'd been dead four days. A dead that was so dead when they opened the tomb, you couldn't have enough for breeze to take the smell away. And later... When all hope was lost and Jesus himself died on the cross, Jesus still is the resurrection, conquering death. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, it's not poetry. It's truth. It's the statement upon which we place our hope. Even though it's a miracle too good to be true so that Lazarus' sister dare not ask for it and couldn't dare even think it might be a reality, by the grace of God, Jesus has them roll away the sown and says, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And resurrection occurs. And folks, it continues to occur even to this day. You might wonder what I mean, that strange statement that resurrection occurs. Well, that idea stuck with me when reading a sermon by the great African-American preacher, Johnny Youngblood. In a sermon on this very text, he says of Jesus and Lazarus and resurrection that resurrection is not a thing of the past. Instead, he says this. He says, there's a going on. I like that African-American term, there's a going on. He says, there's a resurrection going on every time I see a brother or sister come to Christ. There's a going on every time I see a man or a woman go back to school. There's a going on of resurrection. Every time I see a father hug a son, there's resurrection a going on. Youngblood reminds us that renewal and resurrection are continually available to those who believe, for we are forever raised to new life in Christ. Friends, this entire story is a powerful reminder that even in the face of death, there's always hope. I couldn't do those funerals if it wasn't for that. It's a reminder that we are not alone, that there is a, a force greater than ourselves working toward restoration and renewal. And just as Jesus called out to Lazarus, we are called out to speak to those who are dead in spirit, those who have lost hope, and speak life and restoration 
into this story. It's a story that reminds us that hope requires action. Jesus didn't simply pray for Lazarus to come back, but he went to the tomb, actively worked to bring about his resurrection. He called to him. He had him come out and then remove the stone blocking his way. Similarly, if we want to see hope come to fruition in our world, we need to work actively towards it. We need to remove stones that keep people from experiencing the love of justice found in Jesus Christ. We need to remove the stones that are in people's way of finding wholeness and healing. We need to remove the stones that keep us from having a just and equitable society. It's not about building fences. It's about building tables that we can all sit at as community. What about Lazarus? I mentioned that earlier, didn't I? Lazarus didn't have anything to say about this. Might we dare consider what this means? What does Lazarus and his being unbound from the grave and and not speaking tell us? Perhaps it is he is so overcome with joy there are no words. He can't even hardly talk. And that's the promise of a life built on hope that we can experience a joy that even goes beyond words. This promise of a new life, of new beginning, contains the possibility of joy. If we, as theologian and Catholic priest, Henry Nowen urges us to be attentive to the holy and sacred that unfolds before us, I think it's hard to imagine the joy of Lazarus. I think it's hard to imagine the joy of those women when they see their children again for the first time. I think it's beyond words. And when I reached and did a little research, I came across the the playwright. You might remember him, Eugene O'Neill. He won a Nobel Peace Prize in literature. Sidney, you'll have to look him up. You didn't even know who Sammy Davis Jr. was on the way to church. He wrote a play entitled Lazarus Laughed. The opening scene is this. Lazarus comes stumbling out of the darkness of the tomb into the sunlight as if he is seeing the world for the first time. After the strips of cloth that are his grave clothes are taken off of him, Lazarus, Lazarus begins to laugh. He then embraces Jesus, and the only words he can utter are yes, yes, yes. Lazarus makes his way back to the house, and someone asks him what we all want to know. Lazarus, what's it like to die? And Lazarus, he laughs. He laughs even more intensely, and then he says, there is no death, really. There's only life. There's only God. There's only incredible joy. The grave is as empty as a doorway is empty. It's a portal through which we move into a greater and finer life. Therefore, there is nothing to fear. There is only life. There is no death. And as he says this, his laughter, Fills the whole house. I watched a YouTube clip of it. His laughter filled that whole theater. Friends, let us take to heart in these stories of hope. Let us remember that even in the darkest of times, there is always hope, but not just hope. For at the end of hope, there is joy. Let us be about being agents of change in the world, actively working towards a more just and equitable society. And let us never forget that we are not alone, but that it is God there working with us as we strive towards a world that more closely resembles the kingdom of God, the beloved community. God has to be with us in these journeys. I remember 
I remember David talking to me about this Restore 634 thing, and they wanted a house. In Lafayette, I said to David, they wanted a house. I think God helped provide a house. And from the pictures, it seems there's a lot of joy that came out of that hope that you had. Friends, may we be filled with hope. May we share that hope with all around us. And may we believe that hope can bear so much joy that it becomes an infectious laughter. For if our world needs anything, it needs a joy that brings laughter and joy to this community. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand and say what we believe together. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, God has indeed blessed each of us richly. Let us return unto God a portion of those blessings through the presentation of our tithes and our offerings. Thank you. 
Will you join me in the responsive prayer of dedication found printed in your worship material? Let us pray. We believe that God loves us. We believe that God does not give up on us. We believe that God returns to us. We believe that God holds hope for us. We believe help our unbelief. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of valley and grave, we come before you today and pray for your life-giving presence in places that seem dry and dead. There are those places we know from the news, Ukraine, Turkey, Syria, Greece, East Palestine, places where war, natural disaster, and human greed have left dead bodies and broken lives behind. Mortal, can these bones live? You asked, O oh God, and for people in these places, where they have had to bury ones they love, even as they worry about their own living, give them breath that indeed they may live. And then there are the places that don't make the national news, but we know oh so well because they are close to us. Across your created world, your people wait and hope. We wait for an end to gun violence. We wait for an end to racial injustice. We wait for an end to the hatred of white supremacy. We wait for an end to the priority of money over people. We wait for an end to all those things that rob your people of life, that rob your people of breath, that rob your people of wholeness. And we hope. We hope for the promise of the morning, the time when a new light will break on the horizon, hinting at the glory of your presence in our midst. We hope for the promise of the resurrection, of the life that is ours, even when we don't see it fully. We give thanks. As we gaze across your world, O oh God, we wonder where we fit in. Where would you have us be, O oh God? What would you have us do? You know, O oh God, if the bones can live. Do you invite us into partnership with you, as you did with the mortal in Ezekiel 37? Do you extend to us the invitation to co-create? Do you hold forth for us to see the ways we can be the presence of life, <clears throat> of wholeness, of healing for your creation? Is it possible that in those things for which we wait, you invite us to be a sign of hope? Give us the courage to live the reality of the resurrection. Give us the courage to witness to new life. Give us the courage to step into your created world with your words of prophecy, with the courage to believe that you call us and guide us so that bones may live and your people may breathe. In your name, we pray in the way that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. Please stand as you're able and sing together.
as you leave this place, may God bless you with seeking. Seek out the hungry. Seek the weary. Seek the good in every person you pass. Seek out the hopeful and the faithful. Seek God in each of us. As you seek and as you wonder, may you, may you find what you are looking for. In the name of our loving God, who is always seeking to us, go now in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, alleluia. Amen.